What's up? This is Ricky Bromfield, Georgia Tech Special Teams Coordinator, and you're watching FanView Podcast. Thank you. Welcome to the Fan View Podcast. It's your boy G Sports back at it. Sure, can't hear him back at it again. And we got my dog in the building, man. Georgia Tech special teams coordinator, Ricky Brumfield. Uh, real, real good friend of mine. Been trying to get you on, man. Been <laughs> trying to get you on, man. Uh, I know you're down here recruiting right now in the boot. Um, man, we always like to start our podcast all through, man. Just talking about your journey. Uh, what got you into coaching, man? And, and, and talk about um, getting to your new spot, man, down in Atlanta at Georgia Tech now. Yeah. Man, first of all, uh, you know, I wanted to be on before, man, but, you know, right. the schedule's in the line, but right. uh, I'm actually glad it aligned, man, and worked out perfect, man. I no appreciate dope. what you're doing and saw you growing up, man, from what you was doing before to where you at now. Yep. So yep. it's always good, man. It's always a blessing to see people grow. Yep. Um, you know, as far as myself, man, I shoot I'm from here. Yep. You know what I mean? From the West Bank, cut off, went to Shaw, Archbishop Shaw High School, went to college at Utah State. Uh, met my wife out there. Mm-hmm. We ended up moving back to West Virginia. I played like a year at arena football, like arena two football, Bismarck Blaze. You know what I mean? I was making like about 300 a week. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They paid for the food, but the food was like coupons. You know what I'm saying? Right, it was like right. coupons at McDonald's and Wendy's right. and KFC. And I remember it was, a, uh, they gave us a coupon. It was like a $15 coupon at this place called Grizzlies. It was like Applebee's. Come on, man. Man, we used to trade coupons. You know what I mean? Like, hey, bro, I'll give you two McDonald's one Wendy's <laughs> for that, you know what I mean? So, the most out of yeah, bro, you know what I mean? But um, it was in Bismarck, North Dakota, man, but it was it was fun, bro. It was it was good, you know what I mean? And that was my little short time experience playing professional football. Uh, did that, and after a year, it was like, yeah, it ain't gonna happen for me. So, you know, I kind of started, uh, when we moved back to West Virginia, or moved to West Virginia, where she's from, you know, I started working at a detention center and ran into um, a guy named Bill Kerr. Mm-hmm. And we were just talking football, you know what I'm saying? He was coaching at a high school, and he ended up saying, man, you need to come coach. And I ended up coaching over there for like two weeks. So you weren't even thinking about coaching before that? Not really. I still was I still was wanting to play ball, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I really ain't know what I wanted to do, man. Um, and I obviously always loved football because me and him, we talked football all the time. Right, right, right. And he was just like, look, man, you need to come coach football with us, bro. Come on out there. And I went out there, man, was coaching receivers for a couple of weeks. And then he ended up leaving. He got like a graduate assistant job at Union College in Kentucky. And probably about a month later, he called me up and said, hey, man, we need a receiver coach, graduate assistant job. You know what I mean? And this was like in like 04, 2003, 2004. And uh, I was making probably like 25000 you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Falling in West Virginia, bro. right? <laughs> right, right. And um, I was like, well, what does it pay? And he's like, man, grad school and $4,000 a year. And I was like, and I took a walk with my wife and told her and was like, I said, what's the worst thing that happen? I get a, I get a master's degree. You know what I'm saying? It's like, that's the worst thing that happen. Mm-hmm. And so she took that journey with me. We went to Union College, man. Was there for three years. Um, you know what I mean? First year was hard, bro. You know, we had my son at the time. I was on a sofa bed. We was we slept on a sofa bed and my son slept in the corner on the cushions. Right. You know what I mean? In the corner. And after we paid rent, man, my check per month was like $186. And we were on, we ended up getting on food stamps. She was embarrassed. I was like, man, this is what they make food stamps for. You right. know what I'm saying? It's right. not like I'm right. I'm just chilling. And uh we were taking turns calling our parents to pay for the car note. We had one car, you know what I mean? And then the next year, she ended up getting a job on campus as a uh, dorm director. Okay. And they paid her four thousand, and so now we're making eight thousand, living in the dorms for free. And so it just kept progressing from there. And then I graduated. I ended up with like an edu- educational specialist title, um, and she stayed. And you know, she graduated, and then I moved on to Fairmont State, which is where she's from. Mm-hmm. And she was there for like seven years, and I was the uh, special teams coordinator. And throughout that time, man, I was doing, you know, I was just hustling, man. I wanted to to get to the highest level. And I ended up doing an internship in like 06 with Bill Cowher, his last year. With the Steelers. With the Steelers. And I did an internship, and Bruce Arians was the OC. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And, and I did an internship, and then that next year, um, 
Mike Tomlin became the head coach, and I called Bruce Aaron. I was like, Coach, man, I'll come up and volunteer. It was like an hour and a half away. Right. I said, like, man, I'll just come volunteer. I don't care. And he was like, well, come up. Tomlin want to um, want to meet you first. And, man, I got there like 9 o'clock, waited. I ain't talked to Coach Tomlin until like 3 p.m. What you was doing all that time? Just drinking coffee. <laughs> That's a lot of coffee. Well, I was drunk on coffee, dog. You know what I'm saying? Wired up. I was wired, dog. Right. Shaking, you know what I'm saying? Right. And, um, man, I talked to Coach Tom for like five minutes, and Bruce Arians stood on the table for me, man. He came in and was like, you know, B.A. stood on the table for you, and I don't have a problem helping our young brothers like yourself. Right. He was like, so you're more than welcome to come. And so I, I volunteered with the Steelers for three summers during mini camp and OTAs. So when – Everybody else was chilling, you know what I'm saying, in May and June going home. Man, I was doing mini camp and OTAs with, with the Steelers up there and working. Sharpening your skills. Sharpening my skills, man, volunteering, dog, and just networking and learning, you know what I'm saying, and taking everything that I liked and trying to put it into what I do. Mm -hmm. And it kind of got me to be meticulous with a lot of things and detailed. And, you know, through that time, I also did in terms with like the Falcons and Green Bay Packers and the Rams. And, and so, like, every summer, man, like, I was, I was working. And at the time I looked back, you know, at that time I didn't, but now I look back and I'm like, you know, my training camp started like June or July, like 21st or 2nd or something like that. Cause that's when the NFL camps come. And then when I finished their training camp, I come to do our training camp at the college. Right. So During I'm always camp. like doing training camp for me. It was like five weeks. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, the grind, but boy. I was, I was working. I didn't think about it at the time. I just was out there hustling, you know what I'm saying? And doing what I could. So, you know, my seven years at Fairmont State, you know, I was able to do all of those internships and volunteering with the Steelers and all that stuff like that. And um, like I said, I just wanted to grow, man. And I ended up having to take a step back financially to take a step up. And I went to uh, Nickel State mm -hmm. for two years, man. And I was at Nickel State for two years. You was down there in the tri Paris. Down there, man. You know what I'm saying? And, and um, in Thibodeau, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And, and getting mm -hmm. it in and, and had some good experiences and learned. And uh, after two years, um, West Kentucky opened up and Bobby Petrino was the head coach and I played for him at Utah State. Now I never knew you played for Bobby Petrino. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The, I never I, knew that. Now my college career, I had like three head coaches. And so the first head coach recruited me, Charlie Weatherby, he was there for a year and then he left. And then the next year, for three years, it was uh, John L. Smith was the head coach and mm -hmm. Bobby Petrino was the OC. Paul Petrino was the, um, was the receiver coach. And so I played for him. I played for a lot of dudes. Like Gary Patterson was on that staff at one yeah. point. Come on. Yeah. Jim Zorn, you know what I'm saying? Like, bro, big bumpers. Jim Zorn, that's he's the coach for the Saints and was the head coach at Florida. Florida. Yeah. No, he was the head coach for the Seattle Seahawks. He was played in the league. You thinking of the other Zorn? No, Jim okay. Zorn is the older Rick, dude. Rick, Rick Zorn. Yeah. You know what I mean? Okay. And so, like, um, and so it was a bunch of dudes, man, that that I played under, but. Paul Petrino was my receiver coach for three years, and I, I learned a lot from him, man. And that's Bobby Petrino's son? That's Bobby Petrino's brother. Brother. Yeah. Okay. And so, you know, Bobby Petrino um, brought me in. He actually brought me in to do an internship when he was a head coach for the Falcons. I did uh -huh. an intern. That's when I did my intern okay. for the Falcons. Okay, okay. That's uh, when he left Louisville and went to the Falcons. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, um, and then I did uh, – where else? But yeah, so I played for him for three years. He was a receiver coach for three years. Uh, Paul Petrino, man, is his brother and everything. And I learned a lot from Paul and, you know, didn't appreciate it at the time. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And um, But I appreciate it now. And a lot of the stuff that I taught as a receiver coach when I coached receivers was really from him. And then, uh, you know, I was at Nickel State for two years. I was at Western Kentucky. And then Bobby Petrino left, went to Louisville. I stayed with Jeff Brown okay. for two more years. Okay. And then um, Frank Wilson got the job at UTSA mm -hmm. and, and called me in. You know, it was a no-brainer, man. And, and that was his first, first head coaching That job. was his first head coaching job. I'm going to tell you a little quick story about that, too. So he called me, and, um, you know, I mean, I'm telling my wife, like, hey, man, I'm about to get a job at UTSA. Frank called me, man. He said he's going to bring me right. in. Right. That's my people. And she's like, okay, cut okay. Off. We kept talking, man. We kept talking. We kept talking. I talked to Frank about four or five times about the job. And my wife said, well, how much you going to pay you? I said, I don't know. <laughs> She probably like, the first thing you said. <laughs> she was like, you don't know how much he going to pay you. I was like, he said he got me. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? And I was, and then, so now I'm scared. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh, man, dang, it's all right. Let me actually do, man. So I ended up asking how much he was going to pay me, and it was, it was almost twice what I was getting at Weston. And so I was like, all right, whew. you know what I'm saying? So I, I was good. And, um, Wipe you know, his forehead. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? And Frank <laughs> took care of me, man. And, you know, Frank, well, I would say, probably was the best head coach that I had as far as, like, 
making me better. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think other coaches made me better from how they did things as far as, you know, when I was at Virginia, the coach was, like, always wanting me to steal possessions. I had to be creative with stuff. Mm-hmm. But Frank made me better as far as narrowing down some of the things I said and pinpointing how I did things and stuff like that and limiting your cut-up film and all those meticulous detailed things, man. And, you know, some of it, and I told him the other day, man, some of it was annoying. You know what right. I mean? I used to turn around, roll my eyes like this dude, bro. Right, man. right. But when I went to Virginia, so after I was at UTSA for two years, when I went and interviewed at Virginia, I used my drill tape that I that I put together from Frank. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And and got the job over there. And so he taught me a lot in that regards, man. Even recruiting and how you do things and leaving your mark and stuff like that. Wherever you go to school, man, leave your mark. Like, what, you was at this school? I'm like, yeah. He's like, I can't tell. You know what I'm saying? Just stuff like that, man. And, and you know what I mean? So I give I give my man a lot of credit um, in, in helping me groom as a coach. Uh, but then I went to Virginia for four years, man, and, and was was successful over there. And that's kind of where I grew to be more creative. Y'all had a good run, too. Yeah, we had a real good young. Went to the Orange Bowl and, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying, ACC Coastal Conference and brought some dudes up from the boot. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? My man KT signed with the um, Detroit Lions. Yep. And my man Dontavian Wicks is uh, with Green Bay Packers, yep. drafted. And that right there, man, was just like the proudest moment because if, if you would have seen when we went to his high school, how he is now and how he was then, mm-hmm. you'd be you'd be surprised, you know what I mean? Because he was he was, I won't say shy, but he was nervous. You know, in the shell. Mean? Yeah, he was in the shell, man. He was nervous. He didn't know how to talk to everybody. You know what I mean? He didn't. He was scared to open up. Um, and that's how that's how a lot of these kids are. You know what I mean? You got a, a white man with a suit on, another white man with a sports coat on, and you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. and we all surrounding him and asking him all these different things, like, what, what do you want to major in? What what uh, classification is your brother? And you, they're talking all of this language, and he's just like, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Because he's nervous, man. Right, and, right. and to see him open up, man, and grow, and, and I think he graduated almost like a 3.0 or maybe even higher, graduated in May and got drafted, man. That was like one of my proudest moments. And through some adversity at Virginia, man, man with, the, with the injury. Yeah. And then the mad <laughs> shooting. Man. Yeah, that was rough, man. And seeing that, and, you know, at the time, you know, I was at Virginia for four years, and then, Head coach resigned, and I went to FIU, Florida International. Mm-hmm. And I remember when I heard about it, you know what I'm saying, how it hit me, I can only imagine how it hit them right. while they so, were there. So you wasn't there? I was not there at that time. No, I was at uh, Florida International at the time. And when I heard about it, man, it was I – mean, But he knew all those guys. Yeah, yeah. He knew all yeah. Of them. The one that lived, Mike Collins, was uh, one of my recruits. Yep. You know what you I mean? High. It's, mm-hmm. Yeah, you high right up the road, man. And I remember when it happened, I remember calling his mom, and she was getting on the plane. You know what I mean? And she couldn't even talk. And I was just like, I ain't know what to say to her. You know what I mean? It's like, I ain't know what to say to anybody, really. And so I'm trying to call her here who who got what happened to who and who really is it because it was conflicting reports. Mm-hmm. And, um, she, man, I closed my door, man, I just started crying. Right. You right. know what I mean? And it was rough. It was rough for me, and I can only imagine how it was for them. You, know? now, you talk, like, I, I, heard, I hear about, like, the long and tr- and treacherous journey that you was on to get to where you at right now mm-hmm. and we were talking about this on a previous podcast you know how influential was it like having like your wife there to support you all of the, all the way through man i wouldn't have been able to do it without her would not how you gotta understand and, and sacrifice what you wrote i hypnotize him <laughs> <laughs> There's nah, man, she, <laughs> she, you know what I mean? Like, I always tell people, man, marry the person that's going to make you better. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, obviously, all the looks and everything else matter, but she made me a better person. You know what I mean? She still to the day makes me a better person. And, you know what I mean? If I wasn't with her, I don't know what I'd be doing. And so, with all of this journey, it's just like when we started off and I was working and, and I we took a walk and I was like, look, let's, let's go to Union College, man. Let's get this master's degree and and we'll see what goes from there. And just I think just after that, she's always believed in me, man. She's always been like my best friend as far as just believing in me, pushing me, allowing me to be able to go. You know what I mean? Like my vacation days, I was on a 10-month contract at Fairmont State, so I really didn't have to work during June and July. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? But I'm spending a month out of my vacation yep. going up away. You know what I mean? And so her allowing me to do that, man, and I say allowing because we had kids. Right. You know what I mean? I had to take care of kids. So whenever I leave, she's got to she got to hold all of that that burden with the kids and stuff like that. And so, you know, with her and traveling, you know, she kind of did this little thing. We got like a little text thread, Team Brumfield. 
And so it's just us. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And we just talk on that, man. It'd be us. Sometimes it's brutal now. Like at the games, <laughs> Come bro. Come on, man. Bro, at the games, man. My sons, dog. I'm telling you, dog. Sometimes don't hold back. Bro, don't hold back at all, dog. I be wanting to choke them out. Like, bro, I come in the locker room after the loss, it'd be like 80 missed text messages, man. And it'd be like 60 from them. And they just in the thread talking. Like, what are y'all doing? What was that called? Like, that was stupid. Like, y'all practice special team? You know what I mean? Just be killing me, dog. Right, right. And after the game, I just be like, bro, I don't even want to talk to y'all. <laughs> you know what I mean? But but it's real, man. And I think what it did was it kept us together as a family. So, like, everywhere we went, it was us. You know what I'm saying? It was us, man. It's Team Brumfield. Like, it's going to be us. Us against the world. Yeah, you know what I mean? And it's like, sure, I went to West Kentucky. It's us. UTSA is us. Virginia is us. And then we'll kind of expand as we go, you know what I mean? And so she was influential because she allowed me or she let me do what I wanted to do to be able to grow. And she didn't try to hold me back. You right. Know what I'm saying? Right. Man, we always talk about the different trials and tribulations and adversity that these kids go through mm -hmm. when they get into college. Right. But what we don't talk about is some of the adversity and things that coaches go through. Mm -hmm. I remember last summer, no, after the summer, going into during fall camp, I believe a player that's that was in your room, in your linebacker room, bro, um, died. As mm -hmm. a matter of fact, I think the day he died, you were supposed to come on the podcast. Yeah. And uh, man, I remember when you called me, bro. I could hear it in your voice, man. You had been crying. I could just tell how emotional you was mm -hmm. and how it affected you. Uh, man, talk about dealing with that, man. Coaching a kid, seeing him every day. I mean, he's probably seeing you. More than he's seeing somebody in his family because yeah. he's in your room. Talk about how you had to deal with that, man, how that affected you and how you was able to deal with that going forward. Still to the day, man, it uh shit choked me up, you know. <laughs> and being able to see him every day, and you in the room, you coaching a kid, and you laughing, you making fun. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And and you talking about each other and stuff like that. And like a whole two weeks. After it happened, you look and ain't nobody in that chair. Right. And nobody wants to sit in it either. You know what I mean? Like everybody like, man, this is chair. Right. And it just, what it did was, man, it make you realize, just like the street, you know what I mean? Kids can be, it can be here and it can be gone. Mm -hmm. And so all I do is, man, I try to treat everybody like it's my son. Mm -hmm. And I love them up. I go off on them, but I hug them up too. You know what I mean? And so I feel like if I can treat them the best I can possibly treat them, and that's all I could do. You know what I'm saying? And, and we try to remember him. And it happened the same year, you know, later on that year, that's when the Virginia thing yeah, happened. Yeah, yeah, that's what and I'm so saying. And so it was bro. just like, I was just like, damn. Like, you know what I mean? It kind of made me question a lot of things. Yeah, you know what I mean? But yes. at the end of the day, man, you know, you just pray, hope for the best, um, you know, hope for his family the best, and just, man, just keep coaching kids and, and realize, you know, a lot of people say it's a business. It is a business technically. But it ain't, man. It's, it's like we're trying to keep young men off the street and we're trying to help young men grow mm -hmm. and be successful in life. And when I say successful, I'm not meaning make millions of dollars. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Being successful is being happy. Yep. So you can be a high school head coach. you happy. you successful. College head coach. you happy. you successful. You know what I'm saying? Running a podcast. Bro. you happy. you successful. And so I think all I'm trying to do is just help kids, man, grow to be young men. Well, from young men to be better men. Do you think because I'm sure you didn't coach over a thousand kids. Yeah. Right? Do you think that happening to you with a kid in your room passing away, then the kids at Virginia passing away, did that make you kind of reset yourself and say, man, I can't take for granted for each kid that I touch, each kid that I coach, each kid that I have a relationship with? Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, I don't think you can, and it don't matter if a kid is good or not. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, I right. never really cared if a kid, like, honestly, some of my favorite players weren't the best players. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, some of my favorite players, man, they weren't that good. You know what I mean? But they were, like, great men, great dudes, great people. And I'll never take that for granted. You know what I'm saying? And, and like, when I first started coaching, I just love football, bro. I, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I, I wore cleats, practice. I'm doing the drills with them. <laughs> I'm doing all of this stuff. And I'm like, man, it's about football, you know, and this and that. And my first experience where I felt like I helped a young man grow in life is, uh, I don't want to say his name or who right. when, but – came in my room and was like, coach, man, I got this girl pregnant. You know, I'm going to quit and get a job. I'm like, where are you going to work at? And he told me a place and it was like, like what, what, what are you going to do with that for the rest right. of your life, dog? Like, right. you, you ain't going to be able to grow 
with that job. It's like the baby ain't even born, right? So you need to prepare for a long while after the baby is grown. So graduate. I ain't even talk about football. I just like, man, graduate, do this, and then you can work to get the job. I mean, all you got to feed the baby is baby food right now. They ain't costing a lot, bro. So take care of yourself first. It's like the airplane, right? You know what I mean? If something happened, put the mask on your face first and then do it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So you can't just take care of her right now. You got to take care of yourself to be able to take care of her in the future. And we just was talking, man. He just kept coming in the office, talking, talking, talking. And I really ain't think nothing about it. So at the end of the year, we used to always have the scenes come up and talk. And uh, when he came up, he was like, man, I like to thank Coach Brunfield. And just basically threw down everything I did. And I was in the back, like, you know what I'm saying? My head up, like, yeah. trying to blow the tear back yeah. up. You know what I'm saying? I was like, <laughs> and he was just talking about how I helped change his life. You know what I'm saying? And still to this day, I talk to him. Not all the time, man, but still to this day, I talk to him. You know, they owned a couple of um, fast food restaurants and stuff like that. That's and, what's up. And he's doing, he's successful. You know what I'm saying? He's happy. He's making money. He's happy. He's doing good. Daughter is grown and all that stuff like that, man. And so man, for me, crazy, bro. I'm always like, look, man, if you make it to the league, anybody I recruit or anybody I coach, if you make it to the league, I really didn't get you to the league. You right. Have, it's God-given ability. You utilize what we have. A couple of drills I showed you, a technique or whatever the case. But, man, my goal in life is to have somebody come back and say, hey, Coach, man, thank you for helping me become a better man. This is my yep. wife. Yep. This is my son. This is yep. my daughter. This is what I'm doing. That's when I'm like. You can't put a price on that. No, that bro. Feeling? Like, like those, those opportunities, man, for, to coach that one kid, to tell me that, it's worth it. My whole career. Like, my whole career is worth it. Like, I'm not going to be able to save everybody or whatever the case, man. But all I need to do is try to save one. Man, I'll tell you, like, what you said is so powerful. Because I talked to G about it, like, a whole bunch. Like, I've coached kids that's in the NFL now. I've coached multiple All-Americans, like, nationally ranked kids and all that stuff. The crazy thing, too, like, I had three kids pass away. Yeah. You, know, homie, you know, in the high school level. And the craziest thing was... Throughout the state champs and all, you know, all the little scholarships, y'all you know, signing day stuff. My fondest memory is my former players invite me to a wedding, invite me to a gender reveal, invite me, you know, what I'm saying seeing me or seeing my wife and just like running up, like, hey, you know, you know, tell coach, boom, 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 and just like, and to see the family still, like, when you just come around the family, like, it's always still coach, no matter, like, some of these kids. Uh, 25, 26, own family and stuff now. Yeah. Hey, coach. Hey, right. coach. Hey, man, look, you're a man now, man. <laughs> coach. Coach. You know, like, yeah. You know, like, like that's, the, that's the best feeling because when you do it from your heart, mm -hmm. it has no – and you and you're not looking for a handout. Nah. You're not looking for, like, you know, your, your paycheck is that kid leaving and coming back the next day better than when he left. Exactly. He showed up the day, that same day. To exactly. me, that, that's the biggest thing about culture that they don't talk about. What I want to ask you is, what about the mental health for coaches, especially African American coaches? Yeah, you know, on your level, because like you don't you, you don't hear that either. Like you know, you know, you had a loss in your room. You know, what are some things that not only you had to do to kind of get yourself mentally. I got. I got to show up the next day, but also because you're a grown man, life happens. You know, marital, marital um stuff going on, kids. house, yeah. kids, this, that, no, and you still. And when you show up, you gotta be able to like, all right, hey, what we do on Red Bus special? You know, like, like you, you know. So how do you reset, mm -hmm. refocus, and keep going on, and it be a positive, not just something that you just, all right, we're going to toss back there. We're going to keep just cramming it right. back, cramming yeah. it back, cramming it back. I mean, honestly, it's, it's one of the hardest things to do. You know, if you got a passing away of a kid, you still got to move on, unfortunately. Um, you know, you got bills to pay and you ain't got the money to pay it. You got to move on. You know what I mean? And I think, you know, as far as the mental uh, capacity about it, man, it's just, it's one of those things where for me, is I just say, man, I got to go. Like, I, I really, truly, you know, it ain't really deep about it. It's just, I got to go. I got to do this because if, if I allow myself to to show it in front of the kids, I'm holding them back. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I'm bringing them down with me. 
And so it's like crabs in the bucket. You know what I'm saying? If something bad happened, man. I'm not trying to, I'd rather go down myself. You know what I mean? Like I'd rather hold all of the stress in my family myself because I feel like I could deal with it. And I'm going to have to blow some steam sometimes. And I might stress out sometimes, but I feel like I can handle it. You know what I mean? And, and so what I do with it is, man, I just, man, I got to move on. This is not for me. It's not about me. So when I go in that room, you know what I mean? It's not about me. It's about everybody else. It's about the head coach and his family, the receiver coach and his family, the DB coach. You know what I mean? It's like everybody here to win games and do their job as coaches and to, to stay hired, man, to feed their families. And these kids are coming in here with their blood, sweat, and tears mm -hmm. to work to try to win. You know what I mean? I can't allow me not being able to pay a bill. I can't allow a loss that happened hold all of these guys back mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying because i feel like now i'm hindering all of these dudes and so it's always easier said than done but man i just say to myself it ain't about me you know what i'm saying it's, it's about these guys so i'm gonna if i gotta cry cry if i gotta get mad punch a wall whatever i gotta do in the in the privacy and then when i'm coming in public man we, we gotta do our business we gotta move on because i also gotta teach them to grow too yeah i gotta teach them yeah. that you know what I'm saying? Like things don't shut down yep. in life forever. Like you got to grieve, you got to do what you got to do, but things is not going to be permanently shut down. Like life is going to go on. And so you got to learn to deal with it. You got to learn to be able to cope with it. You got to be able to learn to, uh, you know what I mean, to to hold it in and, and be able to explode at a certain way or find a way to explode and get it out. You know what I mean? And so in my mind, I just say, man, look, life goes on. I got to grieve. I got to do whatever I got to do. But when I get in this room, it is, it's not about me, man. It's about everybody else in this whole building. And if I let this incident or if I let this situation control what I'm trying to do, then I'm messing over everybody. Man, uh, the documentary Al Just America <clears throat> came out a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, it's been streaming on Hulu. Been a, a big talk on social media and just different people I've been talking to, not only in Louisiana, but you know, I got family members in Atlanta. My family members in California, yeah. Texas. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they've been hitting me up about it. And just people kind of getting an insight on what actually goes on, not only just in Algiers, but in New Orleans. You grew up in the cutoff mm -hmm. in Algiers, bro. And uh, not too many people make it out yeah. and to be successful. Um, you were one of those people, man. Talk about growing up in Algiers, in the cutoff, and being able to maneuver through all the different things that could have pulled you the wrong way, bro. Yeah. But you still was able to, you know, keep that narrow path, man, and make the main thing the main thing. And that is, you know, you played football, man. You went, got your degree, you got your master's. Now you're a successful African-American college football coach at a, at a premier university like Georgia Tech. Yes, sir. Man, I think it was just really my daddy, man, kind of getting me away from all of the bad stuff. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And, and so, like, you know, growing up in, in, in Algiers and the cutoff, man, like, I saw all of that stuff. And to be honest, I kind of wanted to do some of the stuff. Right. You right. know what I mean? Like, Spend I saw that, like, oh, man, I want, yeah, I want to be like him. I want to do that. You know what I mean? You go play at the park with one of the dudes, and you're like, man, I, I want to be like him. You know right. what I'm saying? And um, it's just, you, you kind of see that, man, and you kind of idolize that a little bit. Yep. But my dad was able to tell me, nah, bro, you're going to go over here. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Nah, you're going to go over and play at Norman. You're going to go play um, at Shaw. And, you know, I got I had jokes about it. You know mm -hmm, what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. people made fun of me and made some mess with me and stuff. But Robert Green talked about that because he grew up in Algiers and his people sent him to John Curtis. And he yeah. said a lot of people was, you know, making fun of him. Like, boy, you yeah. want to Curtis? So yeah. That's crazy. Like, it's, and that's what they're going to do. And half of my partners went to St. Aug. You know what I'm saying? Like, half of the dudes I hung with went to St. Aug. And, right. they, and I went to call my seven. And at the time, call was only seven, eighth, and ninth. Uh -huh. And so I went to call my seventh grade year, but I was already planning to go to Shaw mm -hmm. because the playground I played for, Coach Hank Tierney's sister right. ran it. You know what I'm saying? Right. And so I went to the Shaw games watching Mickey Joseph and all them dudes. I was mm -hmm. running out getting a tea. So I'm like, man, I want to go there. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And that's what Shaw was popping. Like, yeah, it was, it was on Sharon point. Sharon Carey, all them boys Bro, went through All that. them junk, man. Oh, so it was yeah. like, it was, it, and the Shaw in the 90s, dog, was was off the chain. Like, mm -hmm. it was, we were sending like eight, nine dudes D1 every year. Stay so seeing I was them on Friday Night Football. Like, I'm like, man, I'm going to Shaw. And so my whole time, I could have been the first graduating class at Carr. Mm -hmm. But I ended up, you know, eighth grade, I went to Shaw and uh, my dad kept me away from a lot of that stuff. So instead of being around it all day long, I was only around it a couple hours of the day. So when after school or whatever the case, 
I still go over there and running, you know what I mean, over there and playing basketball and the cutoff and all that stuff like that, getting hair cut down, Blair and everything. You know what I mean? And so it's like he kind of kept me away from it a little bit. And then also just the mixture of playing. Man, I played football, basketball, and baseball. So it was so like no time for the I ain't had time. Bro. I was always practicing. I was always gone. I was on baseball trips. I was always doing all of these other things, man. And, and I was kind of out of the streets because I was playing ball. Mm-hmm. And so growing up, I love ball so much that I did what I had to do to play. Right. Like, you know, I was telling You didn't want to mess that up. I didn't want to mess it up, man. I was telling somebody else's story. I, I can say it now on TV because my kid, my man, my pa ratted me out. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Like when I was in high school, bro, I didn't care about football. I mean, I, I didn't care about school. I just cared about football. Right. Like, I didn't care. Like I didn't I fall asleep in class. I didn't care, man. And then at the end of the year, my senior year come. And schools come by. And Coach Hank was like, go get your transcript and give it to him. You did it. You give it to him. You know what I mean? So I had to give him my transcript. They look and they like, nah. and I ain't going to say what I had on TV, on the podcast, <laughs> man, but but I wasn't eligible. You right. know what I'm saying? And um, and luckily enough, I, I got the eligibility in like late April, man. And um, Utah State held a scholarship for me. And so come I was on, man. able to go. And so I always tell people today, like, look, man, the better you do in school, the more options you have in life. I had zero options, bro. Like, my only option was this, Utah State. Um, oh, we from and, home. And I talk about my dad lying on me because I told my kid, well, I got a master's degree now, so I can brag about that, bro. Right. Um, I always told my kids, like, man, that's all you got, 3.0, man. I had 3.5, like, because I knew they always wanted to be better than me. Yeah, yeah. And I just kept telling them what I had GPA-wise and GPA-wise, and, man, I had this. That's all you got? Bro, you got a B? You could have got an A. Right. And I just was on them. My, my oldest son graduated. With like a 3.4, went to Colgate, mm-hmm. graduated. He got a master's degree in four and a half years. My other son is in college right now on an academic and football scholarship. He had like a, a probably a 4.2, I think. You know what I mean? And I remember probably about two year, two or three years ago, we at home. Now, all of this time, bro, I'm at my house, man, my mom's house, and my dad come over. And they just start to like, yeah, Ricky. Oh, he wasn't even eligible. My mama was like, oh, so remember when you had to take that summer school course so in Spanish? So y'all. Like, so y'all. <laughs> you know what I mean? What's your so, kids say? Man, them boys looked at me. <laughs> <laughs> you mean to tell me? That's yeah, kind of like when you find out Santa Claus ain't rude. Yeah, <laughs> dog. That's what I'm like. I'm like, really, bro? You going to tell these dudes this, man? And my mama ratted me out. My daddy ratted me out. I was like, all these years, man. And so they ratted me out, man. You know what I mean? But, but the work was done. It was done. I was I was good. That's why I wasn't that mad. But I was like, hey, y'all done snitched on me, man. But um, nah, man, just uh, it's it's, it's all lovely though, seeing all them all them grow, man, and, and feel good to see where I was and where I could have been to where I'm at now, man. That's why I'm always proud to say, man, I got a master's degree, man. I graduated, and I and when I actually started caring about school, bro, like when I got into grad school, I actually <laughs> I actually cared. Right. You know what I mean? And right. my GPA showed it. Like I got one B. My whole time, but your mindset school. probably changed. You yeah. matured. Yes, yes, one hundred percent. You do you think growing up in the cutoff, then going to Shaw, which that's two different worlds, mm-hmm. but it gave you kind of like that, that balance. Yeah, like even like when it comes to recruitment, right? Because mm-hmm. you could relate the kids that come from the hood. Yeah, and then you could relate relate the kids that kind of was privileged. Exactly, because you got best of both worlds. Do do you feel the same way? Hundred percent, man. Because I think in life you got to learn to deal with all different races and yep. religions and creeds, everything. You got to learn to be able to to talk to different people. Yep. You know what I mean. And so I can go, you know, wherever and talk to this person, talk to that person. You know what I mean. I know how to. I don't want to say switch it up, but I can communicate yep. with yeah. everybody. You, you know what I'm saying. I can speak that language with them. You know what I mean. Like when I'm talking to somebody and you can tell he's a little rough dude, man. I can be like, hey, bro, hold on, dog. Right. You know what I mean? Or I can be like, hey, how you doing? You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. you got to be able to learn to talk to Cold different switch. people, man. Yeah, you, you got to. <laughs> We've all been there. You got to learn how to talk in the, in the boardroom and in the corner store. Yes. You know what I'm saying? There you so, go. Uh, there you go. You got you to gotta switch it up. Because that was a good question because I want to, I'm just assuming, because like I'm, 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 I'm from a railroad, so you know, I'm just assuming that you're Baptist. Baptist? Uh, mm-hmm. Nah. You're not? Uh-uh. I'm nothing right now, dog. Look, I'm, I'm searching. You know what I'm <laughs> You was, was you was raised Baptist. I was raised everything. I I was raised I was, actually I was raised Southern Baptist. Okay, I was raised Southern Baptist. I went to First Agape. I went to Second Mount Triumph across the river. Um, you know, my my mom now is non denominational. I went to Catholic high school. That's cause that's why that's 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 why I was going with it because like like from the hood, raised Baptist, go to a Catholic school. Yeah. Then 
college is Mormon. In, yes. In, in, in the Mormon, so it's like you didn't got right. I, I didn't, didn't even think about that. Like, the tour, you mm. just, the only the only major religion you missing is Judaism. Hey, I didn't see it at all. And you know what, man? I I haven't been baptized, but my my family is um is Mormon LDS. You know what I mean? Right. And, yeah, and a lot of people don't even realize that. But yeah, so man. so on you, you talking about like my wife the, and my kids, right? So, but your immediate family, like your mom and your daddy side. Oh, my mom and my dad. My mom is, uh, she was born and raised, and she raised me Southern Baptist. Okay. You know what I mean? And now she's like, I think uh, it's like a non-denominational church. And my dad is, is uh, he's in another religion. I don't even know the name of that religion. Seven Day of Venice. You know what I mean? He's one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because like, that kind of just, that's more than just uh, like your, your average culture shock. Because like, especially yeah. like growing up, like St. Aug was like, the hood drink, yeah. Like get mm -hmm. that, and I, I I never understood that, but like especially New Orleans, like that. That's what like if you could go any school, go to Saint 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 But then like in the hood, the nickname was like man, they the purple punks. You don't want to go over there, right? You know what I'm <laughs> right. But, but like Shaw was like, all right, that's the privilege school. Yeah. So it was like you you got the hood, like the right, first culture shot came. You up in here with rich white kids. Mm -hmm. Then it was like all right. Not only you in here with rich white Catholic kids, now you go into Mormon town. Yeah. And which is like the the culture, like at least down here, you still like it's still the West Bank of New Orleans. So like the, the it's not a culture shock yeah. all the way, but then to go away and like far away, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so that that had yeah. to be like something. That was that was like the biggest thing for me, man. It was the biggest culture shock ever. Like I was ready to come home after like a week. You know what I mean? Like I went out there and it was talking about all oh, the mountains and feel the water that's coming down and the water's cold because it's the snow that's melting all the way at the top. Man, and I thought it was snow. cool, you know what I mean? But I'm like, and even the first time I saw snow, I'm like, ah, and then the second day, I'm like, man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know oh, if I can get bro. used to I this. My mom, I remember writing my, writing my mom a letter talking about the food is awful. Yeah, I ain't going to ever gain weight. I'm not eating this food no more. You got to send me some food. I'm leaving. I'm coming home. All of that stuff, man. And I never even heard of the religion until I got up there. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, my, my, bless, bless my grandma, man. But I remember her telling me something. I'm not going to say what she said, but I didn't know anything about the religion. John and then I was like, oh, shoot. All right, I remember the commercials. You know what I mean? And then I started seeing the commercials, man. But, like, for me, you know, being around all of the different religions and races and cultures and everything else, man, I'm to a point where I'm like, man, you believe in God and you're trying to be a good person and you good with me. You know what I mean? The one thing I always hated was when people, like, bash another religion. Right. right. Because I'm like, man, every single religion has somebody that has done something that made the religion look bad. Right. So whether it's Catholics, whether it's point. Baptist, whether it's LDS, it's like, it's really the people that has messed it up. You know what I'm saying? You and so, yeah, you could believe what you want to believe, man. And it might not be true to me. It's true to you, but it yeah. don't matter. It's like, man, if you trying to be right. You trying to believe in God. You trying to be a good person. Then for me, what does it matter? You know what I'm saying? Yep. You're going yep. up to the next level and, and it, it is what it is from there. You know what I'm saying? What The only thing I don't like is when somebody bashes another religion. Real like, talk. Who am I just because I believe what I believe to tell you, you wrong. Right. You know what I'm saying? Or what you believe. Oh, that's stupid. Y'all believe this. Oh, man, that's so dumb. Like, bro, how you going to say what I believe is dumb? Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's just how I always felt. And the reason why I feel like that is because I've been to all of those churches, man. I've been to Southern Baptist Church. I've been to non denominational Church, like, numerous times. LDS Church, I go there now. You know what I'm saying? Um, Catholic Church, I did all of the masses when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. So I saw it all. I've seen it all. You know what I mean? And so that's just, that's my opinion of how I feel. You know what I mean? And so for me, you know, it just kind of broadened my eyes to a lot of different things. What I want to talk about, man, is... And I, and I asked Coach Dave Johnson about this mm -hmm. when he was on the podcast. And uh, it seems like in 2023, bro, it's so many successful black coaches from Louisiana, preferably New Orleans. Mm -hmm. You know, you talk about Dave Johnson at Florida State. You talk about Cortez Hankton at, at LSU, Frank yeah. Wilson at LSU. Um, you talk about Cardi Hankton, who's at University of Virginia, your old, your yeah. old stomping ground. Um, uh, so Tony Hall. Tony Hall at oh, Grambling. Jaluk. Coach Jabal Jaluk at Florida. Brock Hayes at Troy. Yeah. I mean, the list goes on and on. And I, and I know I'm forgetting about some people because there's so many. But what has changed, man? And, 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 and 
why why is it today it seems like more black coaches from Louisiana, like I say, preferably from New Orleans, is getting those opportunities. And not only are y'all getting opportunities, y'all taking it and running with it. I think we all helping each other out. You know what I'm saying? Like we, I was, I was just talking to, um, I was talking to Jabon and uh, Dave, man, about this. And we was just talking like, we don't hate on each other. You know what right. I'm saying? Like, man, there's so many kids in this city and in this area that we can recruit. Like, why would I, why would I hate on Jabon? You right. know what I'm saying? Why right. would I hate on Dave and be like, and me and Dave, we in the same conference. Right. I ain't going to ever say nothing bad about the dude, man. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, he a good dude, bro. I, knowing when he was a head coach at St. Oh, like, mm -hmm. why why are we trying to take away from each other, man? We can share the wealth and all grow at the same time. Mm -hmm. Like, you might get him, but all right, I'm going to get him. You know what I'm saying? And it might be a good fit for him to go to Florida State or him to go to Florida or him to go to Troy or wherever it is or LSU. You know what I'm saying? And it'd be a good fit for them to come to Georgia Tech. Like, we we all understand that, man. And we kind of communicate with each other mm -hmm. and be like, hey, you know, they'll call, hey, Rick, man, what you going to do with with him? You know what I'm saying? Are y'all really going to take him? If right. You're like, nah, bro, we ain't going to be able to take him. All right, cool. I'm on it. Hey, tell him, tell him about me. You know what I mean? I'm right. like, hey man, you need to holler at your boy at your ball over there, bro. Right. Okay. Hey, dog, right. It's a real fraternity. At... Yeah, it's a re it's a fraternity, man, and we all take care of each other. Not one person hate on each other. Dog. Right. Not one, man. We all it's all love because we all either worked with each other, grew up with each other. Right. You know what I'm saying? Friends with each other. Like how I'm gonna other. see you again, bro. Yeah, so yeah. like how I'm gonna hate on you and then look you in your face. Yeah. Dude? You know what yeah. I'm saying? And none of us, none of us do that, man. Not one of us do that, man. It's just everybody's just trying to grow. We all trying to help each other. Man, we talk ball with each other. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I used to work with Frank. And you know what I'm saying? All of them dudes, man. We all, we all try to take care of each other, man. Because the more we can help each other out, mm -hmm. the better off we gonna be as a group. You know what I mean? It don't make no sense to try to hold somebody down. Like I said, with coaching. We trying to help young men. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, shoot, we all men, but we trying to help each other out too. Like, I don't need to uh, take all the money. I mean, we can let's like, spare it, let's uh, share it, man, and everybody grow. Frank Wilson, everybody call him the OG. Yeah, you know, is it safe to say that he's the pioneer behind all this? Why there are so many successful black coaches in college football right now? Um, I don't know about the pioneer, but man, he he's the reason for a lot. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know, shoot, I worked for him. I think he. Brock played under him. Mm -hmm. Jabal Day worked for him. You know what I'm saying? Like, so, I mean, damn near. You know what I'm saying? The coach's mm -hmm. staff. I just think about when I was in high school, the coach staff that he had. At, at Walker. Walker. Yeah. yeah. Day, Tony. Um, Jabal. Jabal. Uh, it's two more that I'm missing that all went college. Like, mm -hmm. like when he like when he left, it was like, a, next. Who's next? Who's yeah. Next? Who's they all next? start growing. You know, he's, he's definitely the pioneer for – New Orleans. He in in the way he is. At first, I was like, I don't know, but now that I'm saying stuff, man, pretty much is. You know what I mean? And even me, you know what I mean. My two years working under him, man, and how much I grew from him, I can only imagine. Like Dave and him, I remember going to school when he was at Walker, and he had them boys wearing shirts and ties. Mm -hmm. and he had, he had. And you see a lot of high schools mimicking it. Yeah, people wasn't doing it. Nah, and, and it was a discipline thing, and it was him with. He had tutors for them kids, man. He made sure they go to study hall before practice. Um, you know, he was disciplined with a man. He was on point. Like, I think he always has had, like, a, a CEO business management type of mind. You know what I mean? And, and so I think he always did a good job of just running a program, man. And I think he, what he did a great job of is, is knowing who he wanted to hire and hiring the right people. Because, you know, Frank knew a lot of people, and he probably related to half of the people. <laughs> right, yeah. right. You know what I'm saying? He right. probably related to the whole cutoff. Right. But, you know what I mean? As far as him knowing a lot of people, is a lot of people wanted to work for him. Mm -hmm. And he had to turn around or turn away some people. And they probably hate him for it. You know right. what I'm saying? But right. I think he had a good eye of, of who to hire and uh, who to have under his wing and who to help, you know, grow him and uh, mold and stuff like that. And I think that's why you see me and you see people like Dave and all of those guys. And, you know what I mean? I kind of have grown um, under him and did their own thing. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And, uh, but yeah. He, he, he meant a lot to him. I want to ask you a football question because, like, I understand it, but I'm not going to sit here and say, like, I'm a guru in it because, like, <laughs> I don't dig into it. The special teams aspect of, of, of coaching. Yeah. The special SG. Because most people, especially, like, your average friend, like, even, like, your average coach who don't don't deal with, like, the delegation of certain tasks in um in the said program, we're just like, 
hey man, put a, put a put your best athlete back there, right, and let him do what he do. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. And that's not always case. They don't get <laughs> to understand. Hey, look, we go we gonna set the wedge to the boundary, and we we know he gonna cut it back to the field because we put we sucking everything in, we funneling on this and that. Just talk about like the intricacies yeah. of that of that, and how do you prepare? How do you you know how do you game plan for for um mm-hmm. you know a dynamic person or uh, whatnot and how would somebody like who think they interested in special team aspect like really set themselves to grow in that field? I think if you want to grow in that field, man, you need to go and learn as much as you can as far as going to clinics. I wouldn't even say clinics. Go and talk to other coaches because when you go to clinics, a lot of times it's broad. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Is is it's so wide range because nobody's trying to give away their stuff. Mm. You know what I mean? But when you go to another school, you go to a college, like, you know, you coach here in Louisiana, man, go to La Tech, go to Nickel State, go to Southeast and talk to those coaches and really sit down and get the details of it because it's way more detailed than you think it is. Right. You know what I mean? And from a special teams perspective, biasly, we're the next up from a head coach. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's mm-hmm. like, I mean, should we have a team meeting and they say, all right, special teams, the only people leave are the quarterbacks. You know what I mean? And then uh, when the field goes over, then you tell the O-line leave. But I'm talking to almost the whole entire team, at least 75% of the team every single day, at least. Third phase. You know what I'm saying? And it's like I personally try to make people believe in how important it is. And, you know, I, you know, sometimes you got to argue with people because I'm like, hey, man, it's one third of the game. You're like, well, you know, offense is 75 plays, defense 75, and special teams 30. That's not one-third. I'm like, yeah, it's one-third, bro. Your piece may be a little bit bigger than my damn piece, but it's right. one-third. You know right. what I'm saying? Right. Like, yeah. right. One-third, bro. You know what I'm saying? And I always say, man, it, how you start the game, bro? You know, you start the game with kickoff. And so when we start meetings, I'm like, man, how you start the game? What time the game start? And everybody like, kickoff at three. Yeah, because special teams start the game. Not I ain't put the ball first and ten. Right. And so I think the first and foremost thing, man, is that, the one thing that I do is, you know, and I believe is having passion, right? And my name is on it. And so I'm willing to, you know, I'm willing to die for it. And so when it come out there, man, it, my life is on the line, bro. My family is on the line. That's how I feed my family. So I'm not going to go out there and be like, all right, uh, set the wedge, kick out one, two, and three. Ah, it didn't work. Like, hell no. Nah. Yo, hey, y'all set it up 12 yards in front of the return. How many yards? 12. You know what I'm saying? Pushing up five and you kick out that dude. Where the double teams at? Where yard line? You know what I'm saying? And what where the single blocks at? How we doing this? Who you got? What kind of step is this? What kind of step is that? And so I think when it comes to special teams, you got to be specific. You have to be detailed. You have to see those details. You have to harp on those details. And you have to make them kids do that detail. And you have to make them believe. And you have to find a way every single time to make them believe because I, my career growing up, you know, you had the freshmen, right? And they all want special teams. Why? Because they want to play. Right. They ain't playing offense, defense. They want to play some kind of way, so they want to play special teams. Right. Then you get the older kids that just want to play. They ain't playing yet. They just want to get on the bus, so they want to play special teams. But then when they the starter, then they start fading away. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So you got to be able to capture the minds of the starters. And I tell them, I said, man, there's reasons you play on special teams. There's a reason because you want to get on the bus, because you just want to be on the field, because you just want to help the team, because coach said, hey, you got to start on the special teams. Or you want to make it to the league. I don't give a damn what it is. You better pick one of those five and let's go. You know what I'm saying? And so that's how we always talked about it. And I think I always try to show, like, examples of how kids make it to the league, you know what I mean, on special teams. And I show examples of the reason why you play special teams and the importance of special teams and how it can hurt the team if we're not good on special teams. You know what I mean? Like, I, I remember showing a film one time, and it was crazy because we actually had the kid in the room. When I was, you know what I mean, at the other school I was at, was like, right. we had Bryce Hall, who had got drafted. He played uh, corner on punt return, and he was a safety on kickoff. He gets drafted to the Jets. And you look in on his film, on defense and special teams, I mean, on special teams he's playing punt return cornerback mm-hmm. and safety on kickoff. And so I showed a couple of clips in college. I'm like, look at his, look at this dude. Look at this dude, what are you playing right here? What are you playing right here? And then I showed his NFL clips. Who's he playing right here? The same thing. You know what I'm saying? And I, I tried to relate it to, bro, what you're learning in college is going to help you in the NFL. And so I think it's about capturing the minds of everybody, all wide of range. Like you can't, can't just talk to one group. You know what I mean? You can't just say special teams is important. Let's go. 
It's one thirty game. Let's go. Like you have to make them believe. You know what I'm saying? Because they're gonna lose interest in it. You know what I mean? And they're gonna kind of fall asleep in it because because it is like seventy plays on defense and offense. Right. You know what I mean? And so you got to find a way to make them excited to be out there. You know what I mean? And, and show them the importance of it and show them how important it is to be great on special teams and, and to believe in it. And for me, it starts with me. And it starts with me being passionate. passionate. <clears throat> and it starts with me giving them all of the details. So when you talk about schemes and stuff like that, you know what I mean? One thing that I learned uh, doing those internships mm-hmm. in the NFL is, man, you got to be picky with what you do as far as double teams at the 35-yard line. Well, where's that? 35. Single blocks where? The 30. Well, why are you not at the 30? You're wrong. You know what I mean? Like, what step is this on punting? Real particular. It's a J step. Why is it a J step? Because there's one man outside my frame. What is this step? You know what I'm saying? Like, and I try to keep it simple, mm-hmm. but look extravagant. You know so, what I mean? So everything you do, you want to make it look extravagant. So in your, in, in your opinion, since like with doing the internship at the NFL and coaching college balls as long as you have – you think the biggest difference in the two levels is the details? I do. I think the difference is the, uh, the details. When you get to the NFL, they scheme differently because it's a little more personnel driven and things like that. Mm-hmm. But what I learned from them from an individual standpoint, yeah, is the details of it. And when you get to college, you know, sometimes some people just feel, man, just get the ball back to the offense. You know what I mean? When it's punt return, kick return, just get it back to the offense. Kick off, punt, just don't mess it up. You know what I'm saying? And my mind frame ain't like that. Like, I think how I'm going to steal possession. How I'm going to steal possession. Every game. Flip the field position. How I'm going to steal possession. I don't care what it is, man. If I I'm go on two on punt, go, go. You know what I'm saying? Or fake a punt or fake a field goal or, or do something. Or go, let's, man, let's go block this kick. Or let's go punt return. We got two returners. You know what I'm saying? Kick return, man. I'm faking a reverse or something like I am trying to steal a possession without putting my team in a bad situation. And so, however I can steal a possession, then I'm going to try to steal that possession because that's going to help our team win. You know what I mean? And so, I'm always trying to find some kind of something to be – like, if I was a high school coach, I would probably spend more time on special teams. Like, I don't understand why people don't. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because a lot of people don't have those details of special teams. You know what I'm saying? And I think you could steal so many possessions of special teams, especially on a high school level, like crazy, man. Uh Devon TV and Martin, who was from my hometown, yeah, uh, played at Washington State, but ended up uh, finishing off at Oklahoma State. Mm-hmm. Led the Big 12 in receiving. Was the Fiesta Bowl MVP, right? Mm-hmm. Goes undrafted to the 49ers. Mm-hmm. The only reason he made the final 53, because the special teams coach loved him. And he, he was an impact player on special teams. And we're talking about like a phenomenal player. Mm-hmm. I just said he led the Big 12 in receiving, bro. Tremendous yeah. potential. You know what I mean? And so, you know, it goes back It goes back to what you see. You know, some kids, they get a little butthurt when they find out they got to play special teams. Mm-hmm. But what you fail to realize is if you ultimately trying to get to that next level mm-hmm. and get paid for this, you might have to play special teams. Yep. Racy McMath, who played at Edna Carr, played at LSU, got drafted in the sixth round. He made his mark on special teams. He now how he's starting out. to see some, some, some burn – at the receiver position, but his mm-hmm. first couple years in the league, bro, special teams. Yep. Right. And so, you know, I'm glad you I'm glad you brought that up because people forget about that third phase and don't understand how important it is. Percy Butler played at UL Lafayette, mm-hmm. got drafted in the fourth round mm-hmm. by the Washington Commanders. They said he was the best special teams player in the whole draft. I just think about too, yeah, like people from our era that or not even not not necessarily our era. The people that that we we did watch league the league for a long time now that stole years, stole checks, like <laughs> you know, this is like just right. being so dominant on special teams. Like somebody like Cardell Paris, Devin Hester, like hey, you are so special. Troy you Brown, do, you know Dante yeah. Hall. You know what I'm saying? Just hey, you're so special to do. Let's see if we can get you another skill. Steve set. Gleason. Oh, all right. So now you can not only. Can, Let's do, let's do Scott Darrell Paris because he's the one that's still in the league right now. Not only can you return punch now, you can you can you still got the rec- he was a receiver for most of your life, so that's not going away. Mm-hmm. Now we can also put you in the backfield and run the ball too. Yeah, and at any given time, 
Go make a play happen. You, you, you're second mm-hmm. to Devin Hester in, re, in return touchdowns. And somebody who was a bust, quote unquote, because he didn't excel at his position that he was drafted at, has been in the league almost 15 years. Yep. Yep. There's people, man, that one of my guys that uh, worked with me at UTSA, he played in the league for eight years, pretty much all special teams. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And that's eight years in the league, man. That's eight years of NFL paychecks. And you know what I'm saying? Time. Playing on special teams. And it's like, bro, what's better than that? You know what I'm saying? You even save your body. If all you play with special teams, you save your body. So, right. Um, right. And it's just like, man, I always tell the kids, like, you love football. And they're like, yeah, so why wouldn't you want to take an extra play? Right. Like, hmm. why wouldn't you want an extra play, bro? Like, if, if coach said, man, if you're going to overtime, you're going to play. So why the hell wouldn't you want to get on this kickoff team real quick? You know what I'm saying? And kids come like, hey, coach, man, I'm going in the next series. Can somebody get me? Like, nah, bro, we'll get you on the next play. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can take off this next play because obviously you don't think this kickoff is important. Right. Because it was one play for a large chunk of land. So if they return this ball at the 50-yard line, bro, then you covering somebody at the 50. So would you rather cover at the 50 or would you rather cover at the 20? And if you really love football, you want to do it. Right. Like, go. And if you need to take a playoff, take a playoff on defense or offense, man. And and that's how I've always felt just because I've coached special teams so long, man. I got – I have passion and, and I'm always used to fighting for it, man. Like, sometimes – every once in a while, man, I get I get tired of fighting. You know what I mean? I'm like, man, I'm tired of fighting for special Because, like, every day I got to fight. I got to fight coaches. You know what I'm saying? And sometimes coaches be like, man, I'm going to – all this special teams time. You know what I mean? And they, mm-hmm. they don't want to give you that time. Like, say, bro, you can cut the time short and we can start the ball at the 50 if you want. You know what I'm saying? And right. Call it and call it fat catch every time and start at the 25, bro. Mm-hmm. It's, it's on you, homeboy. Right. What you want to do? Right. You know what I'm saying? Because right. it ain't gonna be a touchback every single time. Right. And then if we miss a field goal, then you are gonna be crying about why we ain't make this field goal. Right. So what you want to do? Are you want to take uh, eight hours doing defense? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and skip everything else. And uh, most of the time, man, you know, coaches just be messing around and stuff like that. Right, but, right. But, you know, sometimes every want, once in a while, some coaches, <laughs> we want our some endo. coaches, boy, the old line coaches be wanting their endo. <laughs> oh, hey, old line, D-line coaches, boy, they be wanting their endo, man. Hey, hey what we got today? Right. The kick return? All right. Uh, right, right, right. <laughs> they be like, we ain't doing field goal today. Already yeah, they be wanting. 10 more minutes. Yeah, right. you know what I'm saying? They be wanting, they be wanting that indie, dog. But I get it, man. You know, everybody want to be great, man. But. You know, I just always had a passion for special teams, man. And honestly, it's one because my name is on it, man. And everything I want to do, I want to be great. Like, I want to be known as the greatest special teams coach in the world. You know, they used to talk about, like, Beamer ball. Like, I, yeah. I want yeah. to be Brumfield ball. Yeah. Like, I really, I really do. You know what I'm saying? And it's not me coming from a selfish standpoint, like, me, 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 I, I, I. But, like, when I want to see, when, we, when you talk about Georgia Tech football, like, I don't want the paper to say offense and defense had a great game. Like, I want them to say special teams, offense, and defense. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I want them to talk about all three phases um, because I'm in charge of it. Right. You know what I'm saying? So if I'm in charge of it, man, I want it to be great. You know, I don't need my name plastered out there, but that's just my mind frame as far as I want it to be Brumfield ball. I want it to be great, man. I want it to be, when they talk about Georgia Tech football, I want them to talk about special teams. No doubt. Yeah. Um, before we get ready to wrap up, I do want to mm-hmm. ask you this. The landscape of recruiting is, is is definitely changing and evolving year in and year out. When you talk about NIL, when you talk about the transfer portal, and you've always been known as as a really good recruiter, bro. Mm-hmm. You know, you talk about those group, those group of kids you you got up there to Virginia that was impact players, yeah, right. Um, and now you're at Georgia Tech, you know, back in that conference in the ACC, man. How are you attacking recruiting these days? Versus how when you was at UTSA, at Western Kentucky, Florida International, like, you know, what are some things that you feel like you got to do a little differently now, you know, as it pertains to recruiting these kids in this day and age? Really just telling them more about the school and where we're at. And what helps me out is the kids I did recruit in the past. And, you know what I mean, they're speaking for me. Mm-hmm. They you know testimonies. Yeah, they're, they're testifying for me and they're saying, hey, you know, Coach B is a good dude. You know what I mean? You look at you even at St. Aug, head coach at St. Aug, Nick Foster, I recruited his brother. Yep, Ethy. You know what I'm saying? Ethy, man. And Ethy graduated with me. And Ethy still be, he probably, if you're listening, he probably mad at me because cause I ain't see him yet. You know what I'm saying? But, like, we still got a relationship. Yep. And I recruited that boy back in, like, 05. And so, you know, when I talked to, like, a Nick Foster, like, we, like, family. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Like, yep. his mom and dad used to bring me hot sauces when they used to come to the games and stuff like that. So, like, we, like, family. So, like, at my past recruiting, 
kind of helps me with the present and the current recruiting. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And then just that's where I'm at right now, man. It's it's a it's a high academic school. Yep. It's a high academic school, and what I tell kids, man, is it's like it's like um. Tulane and LSU put together. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Tulane education, LSU football. And so when you look at those two different things, man, it can't be anything better. So the difference now is just really kind of going in depth with the parents and, and recruiting the parents and the families more, you know, and they got all these NIL things and stuff like that. But at the same time, you know, NIL is all temporary. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, why are you in school? And that's it. And so you have to look for life after football. Yep. Like, what are you going to do for life after football? And so you have to kind of just throw them, excuse me, start showing those people and recruits and players and parents, like, what they're going to get after football is over with. You know what I mean? And so the way I recruit now from in the past, in the past, you know, it was mostly just, hey, come to the school, look what we have. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And playing this offense, mm-hmm. playing this defense. Mm-hmm. Now it's like, look, look what you're going to have after football. Like, this is what you're going to have after football, man. You're going to get a good degree. You're going to be able to network. You're Especially in the downtown. city of Atlanta. Bro, you right there in downtown. You look out your window. You see Google. You see TNT. You see all of these Fortune 500 companies. We're right there. And so not only are you going to have your degree, but we're going to put your degree to work. Yep. You know, there's some schools say, hey, we got great academics. Here's your degree. Go find a job. Well, we're going to have networking and internships for you during the summertime. And so now, here's your degree. Oh, by the way, remember the company you interned for? They're ready to hire you. They're ready to hire you. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I, I, and I tell kids all the time, I'm like, look, bro, you want to make it to the league, right? Well, what's a great NFL career? And usually they give me a number like five to 10, mm-hmm. right? And I say, okay, you tell me five, when you graduate, you're going to be 20. I mean, when you finish playing football, you're going to be 27 years old. You know what I'm saying? Like, bro, you think you're going to live off your NFL money the rest of your life? It ain't happening. Right. So imagine stashing your NFL money and then graduating and having a networking and going to a college where the starting salary is number one in the state of Georgia. Hmm. You know what I mean? And so, you know, we talk about those things and let them know, you know, I let them know the opportunities they're going to have life after football. I really don't even talk football a whole lot. Right. You know what I mean? Like once we get into it, we'll talk when they ask me about the offense, the defense. I don't even talk about football a lot. I talk about my journey. I talk about the reason why I care about academics. I talk about, you know, how I was raised. I talk about being ineligible. Now I have a master's degree. My wife has a master's degree. My son has a master's degree. My other son, you know what I'm saying, is on the dean's list in college. And so, you know, I talk to them about those things and the importance of education and academics and that I don't just say it, like I live it. You know what I mean? And I didn't believe it in the very beginning when I was 17, but I believe it, man. I wouldn't be here right now if I didn't have what I had. Do you feel like the parents, like with with, with the – the rise of the NIL, do you feel like the parents are are like drawing like NIL stuff at you more than like, hey, what type of education my kid could get? Is, is it more on the landscape or not? Man, look, Georgia is offering my kid 1.3. You know, yeah. this one's offering my kid one. What you what can you do? Kind of mm-hmm. like the blue chips deal. Some sometimes, man, but like I really haven't personally dealt with that because you really aren't supposed to talk to them about NIL right. or the money and stuff like that. You know, once they get that, um, it can be talked about as far as different companies mm-hmm. and different things and the deals that we have for other kids and stuff like that. Um, but I think a lot of times it's more the parents worrying about the NIL money than the kids, so to say. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so I, luckily I haven't had to deal with it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I just deal with the recruiting part, man, and all that other stuff. Yeah. I just, I kind of let that you Just do your job. Yeah. You know what <laughs> I mean? I just do my job, bro. I try to bring them to the table after that. Hey, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh, you coach. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you what, man, you, you definitely in a, in a prime location like Atlanta, man. I mean, for, yeah. for those of you that are listening to this podcast, <laughs> if you've never been to Atlanta. Hot I've been land. on Georgia Tech campus, bro. It's, it's a it's, beautiful thing. It is nice. It's beautiful. Um, yeah. There's a lot of successful African-Americans in, in Atlanta. Um, I've had a bevy of people that I grew up with that has moved to Atlanta and is highly successful, man, owning businesses, uh, working for some big-time companies, making a, some good money, and just, just seeing a lot of success down in that area. So, you know, I think you're in a, in a, in a good situation over there at Georgia Tech, man. I love it, man. Like, honestly, I love it. Two out of five graduates become millionaires. At some point in their life, man. Man, that, I probably stopped my pitch off with it. Bro. <laughs> I'm starting no. hey. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? We, we put it out there, man, and they have, like, a billboard, and we got a couple of edits and stuff that talk about that, man. But like, when I first got there, I heard it, and at first I was like, 
You know yeah. what I mean? I was yeah. like, so you start looking at the numbers. Yeah, I start looking at the numbers, and I start realizing, man, this is a higher engineering school. It's a technology yeah. school. It's mm-hmm. software. You know what I mean? They have a lot of those. Those are the base. I don't want to say base, but those are the top degrees, and those degrees produce a lot of high salaries. You know what I mean? So. I see it, and yeah. I see the networking, and I see the, the Fortune 500 coming. Yeah, I'm no like, doubt. and then everybody I know, now most of them are in football, but I swear to you, everybody I know that has graduated from Georgia Tech are millionaires. I you know what I'm get, saying? I need to get five people with me and say, look, like, we're going to Georgia Tech. We're going to sign a deal. Like, <laughs> what, what, hey, hey, you know what I mean? Two out of us make it. You know? Right. We split the split the bread. Right. You know right. what I mean? Right, right. I mean, you can't help but make money if you're around money. You know what Ooh. I'm saying? Like that's you ain't you gonna be broke if you're around broke people. But yeah. if you around people with money, you are gonna make money. Show yeah. me the yeah, show me the company you keep. I'll show you who you, you know are. What I'm saying. So if you want to make money, be around money. But y'all talk good stuff, man. You got yeah. a boo a boo boy committed already, man. Hopefully, you know you get a, a few more uh, signed on before signing day. Before we let you go, man, we gotta get into Coach Ricky Barfield's <laughs> favorites, man. Here we go. Here we go. Favorite NFL player of all time, Jerry Rice. There we go, frat brother. Play a play receiver. I always wanted to be like Jerry Rice, man. I wasn't the fastest, but that boy Rops was cold. Right, I, right. I did have hands, though. You know what I'm saying? Gotcha. <laughs> you, was like a Chris, you was like a Chris Carter? Bro, I used to sweat glue, dog. <laughs> <laughs> sweat glue. Ball just stick to my hands. Yeah, you know I mean? yeah. Uh, favorite movie of all time? I heard you ask, which one I was thinking about it, man. I um, <laughs> I got really two, bro. Like, football movie or sports movie was the program. That's yes. a good one. Program, That's a good one. you know what I'm saying? Adam I remember, up. remember Darnell Jefferson return that punt, looking at the hand like yeah. that. You know what I'm saying? At the end, yeah, that was like my favorite part, man. And then uh, I like the Usual Suspects, man. Mm, okay, Kaiser Suze. That's, that, I don't that's know if y'all remember that. We, we, we you remember that? that? You I never remember, heard that? No, yeah, I remember. Yeah, I said yeah. up like, like that's that's the answer that we had. I need heard. to go back and watch like, that. Usual movie. Suspects was off the chain. Man. I need to go back and watch that. Yeah. All right. Oh, uh, favorite sneaker all time. I would probably say like Air Max 95s. That's a good one. I got about five pairs. That's a good one. Yeah. No, I don't. I, That's no, a good one right you there. You don't know about the Air Max 95s? No, I, I, no. I'm, not, I'm not a shoe person. Yeah. You know, so like, if it ain't, I'm, I'm just being honest, if it ain't the pumps. <laughs> BK I some pumps. Deep brown pumps. <laughs> I had some pumps. So BK I used to really pump the things. I'm thinking it's going to make me jump high. Man, look, some my dad. So is some soldieries. Man, what? <laughs> Come on now. Hey, my dad beat the crap out of me because I got some pumps and I was like, like, he like, let me have them for my birthday. And I'm just up there. Right. Like, man, stop. You're going you gonna, you gonna to bust up. Man, whatever, man. <laughs> but you know what's so crazy? When you that sucker, it do make the shoe tighter. Yeah. 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 When that sucker bust, and I had to go home. Like, I'm talking about like, this is within hours. And I had to go mm-hmm. home and see him. <laughs> Ain't want no pumps no more. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite comedian all time. Comedian, damn, bro. Um, man, I was a big Chris Tucker fan, man. We, oh, you, know, you finally got, got you I finally one. got me one. You, you know finally, finally got, got me one. Chris it Tucker, took you dog. eighty years. Yeah, yeah. Chris yeah. Tucker, I got, I got me one. When was Chris Tucker was on um, Def Comedy Jam back in the day, dog? And he, he, robbed, he robbed his mama. <laughs> he robbed. Two of y'all, man. You know what you doing? My mama pitching you first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If Chris Tucker don't go Muslim. I'm telling hey, y'all, we're right. talking about him Tucker, as bro. one of the top comedians of all time, dog. Just, but he went I, Muslim. I, I'm just That's your guy? What? I, like, I, I, what? I didn't, I'm just being honest. I didn't see They him. laughing at me like bro. Chris Tucker. Chris Tucker was funny. I'm like, like dog. Go, go, back and watch, go back and watch uh, Def Comedy. Dog, Jack, I, 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 yeah. I remember, my, my, dad, my dad had every season on VHS. So, like, it was yeah. like that and Kings of Comedy was like, like, yeah. at, like we watched the tape of that, like, every weekend mm-hmm. so right like i i know him like but to me like it was the bernie max the every not the every spirit um oh, what is every's last name oh i know Arnett, you're talking about. Arnett, 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 J, yeah you know, like, like like it was like like those mm-hmm. like yeah earthquake those, and them yeah yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. that's why i was like nah, them dudes was funny too, yeah yeah it yeah. was like i couldn't yeah I, you know michael call you and all of like, like all right once I'm in but, that but, but, but I'm just telling you, man, all that junk, man, like everything Chris Tucker be doing, like with money talks and he in jail. He talking about, man, take me to jail, man. I'm going yeah. back to all my friends and family, yeah. man. I don't care. You know what I mean? Like yeah, everything no. he did was this junk was crazy. As a matter bro. of fact, I just watched this movie, the movie uh, last night, the new Jordan movie. But Air, yeah. Yeah, I just watched Air. Chris Tucker in that movie. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah he, 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 he uh, the, not the CEO of Nike, but he was the, uh, 
I forgot. I what forgot it, what the was. title it was. It wasn't marketing. It was something. Yeah, some, I think it was marketing. It was something. Might have like been. That. No, it wasn't marketing. The other dude was marketing. I forgot PR? what his title was. Something. Like but that. uh, it's a it's a hell of a movie, yeah. bro. It show you how Sonny Vaccaro yeah. signed Jordan. Yeah, I, and, and I, I want to see it. Yeah, I watched it, bro. It's, it's it's a hell of a movie, dog. Uh, favorite coach of all time, no matter what level, that made the most impact on you. It has to be uh, Coach Hank. Tyranny. Yeah, Coach Hank Tyranny, man. Like I think Big Fee said, Coach Hank, yeah. Coach Hank Tyranny, man. His wife Joanne, his sisters uh, Miss K. I played at the park with Norman, Miss K, and Miss Nell. Like took care of me, man. Like you know what I'm saying. When you look at, you know, hate to say the race, two white women, man. It was like my mama. Yeah. Damn. You know what I'm saying? I like, say a lot. Yeah. Still to this day, man, I got nothing but love for him. I still, if I got time, you know what I mean? Like, when my family come, I go see Miss Nell and Miss K. As many times as I can. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I let them see my family, man. Like, I I grew up at that house. You know what I mean? Like, right. I used to walk to her house, man. They give me a ride to school and stuff like that. Right, they right. Give me pancakes and everything. You know what I'm saying? In the morning yeah, and stuff like her. that. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know what I mean? Like, they took care of me, and it wasn't taking care of me from a – they thought I was gonna be this type of player, yeah, type yeah, take care. Yeah. It, was, it was out of love, just straight it was out of just love. Straight out of love, man. It was out of love and just trying to see me be good in life. You know what I'm saying? And, and kept me away from a lot of different things, man. And took me places and picked me up and stuff like that, man. So like, I got nothing but love from his cadence now. But Coach Hank, man, was like probably the greatest coach I ever had because he was still to this day, this man could yell and cuss us and we got to take it. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. And, but he also loved us, bro. Like he used to pick us up sometimes and go off on us, man, watch film and then give us some pizza, bro. Yeah. Give us a ride home. You yeah. know what I mean? And, and, and give you lessons that you don't even realize till afterwards and stuff like that. So, you know, big time shout out to Coach Hank, man. I'm glad he backed at the, you know what I'm saying, at the Archbishop Shaw High School. Hopefully he get it turned around. I hope so, dog. Favorite rapper all the time? Man... My favorite rappers that I could listen to every time, I'm gonna say the, the the best rapper probably lyrically, I'm gonna say is like Lil Wayne, obviously. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But my favorite rappers, man, that I could listen to every single song, I'm gonna say two of them, Juvie and BG. Yeah. I, I can listen to BG, BG, and I and I honestly, some of it too is because I know what they saying is real. Like I used right. to see Juvie, <laughs> right. I used to see Juvie every every Sunday, bro. Every Sunday and Thursday on the lake. You know what I'm saying? Then we go down to the, the dagger shop on Crowder. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Out in the street. And then on Thursdays, you see him at the House of Blues. Mm -hmm. I saw Juvie all the time, dog. I used to see BJ sometimes, but I knew what they talked about was real. And when they right. talked about something, like, oh, I know what he's talking about. Right. Oh, right. okay. Oh, over right. there. Oh, over there. Like, Derby, uh, all this stuff they talked about, I knew what they were saying. But, like, for me, those are my two favorite rappers, man, like, of all time. Like, I could listen to them dudes every single day. You know, if you're talking about lyrics and everything, you know, you gotta say Wayne and and I, you know, I heard homeboy Jada Kiss, Jada Kiss that yeah, too. Yeah, but, yeah. But he just he, he just didn't go commercial. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But yeah. I'm I'm gonna play I'm playing BG. That's why I put. If you look on one of my twitters, man. I put free BG because they said he was getting out. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I tweet all that yeah. man. Free Brand. BG, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know what I'm saying? What's yeah. happening, dog? He don't know me from Adam, dog. I'ma still be like, what's up, <laughs> right, dog? Right, right, right. <laughs> Last question for you, mm -hmm. man. What's Coach Brunfield's in game? I want to be a head coach. I want to be a head coach um, at a college program, and I want to be able to, to be great doing it. You know what I mean? I want to be able to run the show. Like I said, I feel from a bias standpoint, man, I feel special teams is the next person up from a, a head coach. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel like I talk to the whole team anyway. And so I think all you got to do from there is just be able to coach the coaches. Yep. I think when you're a head coach, man, you just got to be able to coach the coaches and have them all on the same page. They may not want to agree with everything you're doing, but when we leave the room, this is what we're doing. And so, you know, I want my end game is to be a head coach, man. Well, you, man. Got, you got your um, director of recruiting right there. <laughs> he in, dog. He, he in. Coach, you know he know man. everybody, dog. You know? <laughs> if you need a D-line coach, man, you know, I, man, I hop. You ain't getting all that indie time, dog. It's going to be all special teams. Oh, hey. oh. <laughs> hey, just, give, just give me 20 minutes. That's I got right. you. I can That's do that you for you. I can do that for you. Watch me work wonders. I can you do that for you, You must be with your 20 minutes. Hey, man, I didn't have a coach who said, you got five minutes of indie. What? My first my first, my first, first coaching job, and I and it's crazy because I, I was drawn into a coordinator spot, but the head coach was the was the opposite coordinator. And he just, yeah. and he, so I was the offense coordinator. He was the defense coordinator. And all he wanted to do was go one- like best on best and like to see who like he's one of those 
you know, I'm gonna Pull show you. I'm gonna show you. I'm, I'm better than when the offense did what it did. The next year, let's switch roles. Right. Mm-hmm. Then when the defense did what it did, it was like, it was like I'm. But like he was like, you only get five minutes of Indy. So whatever, pick the group. You get that five minutes, and you just, so I had to learn. Lord, that five leave. minutes go by so fast. Man, tell me about five it. minutes for D line coach. Man, look, I don't want to stretch no nothing. Hey, let's get it, baby. Hey, <laughs> squeeze it. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong on me. Hey, hey, Wrong on me. Hey, 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 don't go to the three, baby. Don't go up field. Like, right. Baby. All right. 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 Let's go. Let's go. I, I, I be doing individuals doing one on ones. I, hey, y'all two do one on one. Switch. Man, I, hey, I'm the, but I'm also the king of stealing time. If yeah. you over there, po, we gonna go over packing. They ain't got shit to do with that, baby. Let go. Right. Right. <laughs> Real talk. Real talk. Man, Coach Bronfield, bro, I, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Appreciate like you I said, me, man, bro. we uh, we've been talking about getting you on here, yeah. man. I knew. You know, a lot of your journey, man, and I know your story, and I wanted you to come over and share that with the viewers, man, because I, like we always say, man, when we bring different guests on this podcast, we know it's going to inspire people, man. Mm-hmm. We yeah. want to entertain, but we want to educate and inform too, man, and I know mm-hmm. it's going to be a number of people that's going to take stuff that you talked about today and be able to apply it to their life, as, as, as well as me and Coach Hen. Mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And that's what and that's all we're trying to uh, um, provide on this platform, man. Keep on elevating. Man, I, I didn't know you wanted to be a head coach, but guess what? We're going to speak it into existence, man. Let's get it, Power the tongue. Let's you, get it, You dog. will be a head coach. There you go. Let's get it. There you go. Let's there get you go. It. There you and go, I, man. And when, you, and when you get it, whatever you, when the ESPN break the news, we go home. No, 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 no. ESPN ain't going to break the news. But you, I don't, you know, I Come on, now. Come on, now. Y'all going to break the news. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. I don't know. Just send me the tape, G. You know what I'm saying? I don't know what's going on. I'm going to let you know when you can break it. Then ESPN going to break it. You know what I'm saying? Because the school, you know what I'm saying? Some schools were like, hey, look, we break it. You do what you gotta do. Yeah. After when they break it, when they break it, what's your thing? You know they got that. Yeah. What's yours? I gotta, I gotta come up with something. You are now rocking with. Man, make sure y'all make sure y'all subscribe to the Fan View Live page, man. Make sure y'all subscribe to the G Sports page. Share to to share to a friend, to a friend, to a friend, to a friend. And, yeah. and let everybody know, man, this is the number one podcast, not only in the state of Louisiana, man, but in the country, man. We are going to keep doing our thing, man. It's Coach Hens, yes. G Sports, Coach Brunfield. Man, we signing out. Peace out. Step Construction is here for you with a brand new offer. We now provide affordable storage sheds. Stop wasting your money on overpriced storage units and portable containers. Step Construction can provide you with a custom shed that will fit your budget and storage needs. So contact Step Construction today at 504-340-5809 for your own personal quote. Let us help you take the next step at Step Construction.